I titled this presentation, What to Do When Your Spine Wears Out. I just advance it. There we go. What to do when your spine wears out. So I'll talk a little bit. Uh, Dr. Swami gave a great overview of lower back pain. Uh, this presentation, just to keep things interesting, will focus more on the upper back pain, neck pain, and, and what to do when your neck wears, wears out. Uh, and I'll tell you how people are currently managing in southern Alberta and, and how we're trying to uh, advance things for the next generation. I'll talk about three areas, okay? I'll talk about acquiring human intelligence. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of spine surgery and how scholars over thousands of years have studied the spine and have thought about the, the human spine. I'll talk about how we apply this human intelligence to treat patients every day here in, in Calgary and in southern Alberta. And then I'll tell you about the next generation of intelligence, artificial intelligence, how we're starting to use very sophisticated computer programming techniques uh, and distill that down uh, to allow you to discover uh, how others have managed their problems uh, and, and how you can take advantage of that data. So it's, uh, you know, it's tough in, in uh, a short presentation to talk about the history of, of spinal disorders, but really when you go back to the literature, and I remember as a medical student and, and as a resident going into the, the basement of the libraries in Toronto and looking up some of these old papers, uh, here's, a, here's an image that Leonardo da Vinci uh, sketched in the 1400s, and he was studying neck muscles and how how people use neck muscles to hold their head upright to be able to look forward. And these are just magnificent drawings and to capture such detail. Moving, moving forward a couple hundred years, this is a New England Journal of Medicine article written in 1815. And in this paper, they describe the, uh, the, this is the first published report of a procedure called the cervical laminectomy. Uh, and the procedure was performed a year before they published this paper. Uh, and, and today, you'd, you, they would reject this paper pretty quickly if you tried to describe a surgical procedure like a, a, a laminectomy uh, in such a prestigious med medical journal. But this is a procedure we still do every day at Foothills Hospital uh, to, to help people with different types of, of problems. So this this acquisition of human intelligence has been going on for thousands and thousands of years, but I, I really think in the last 50 years or so, we've made some major breakthroughs. And, and as Dr. Swamy pointed out, biology is one of those key factors that allowed us to, to make breakthroughs, and imaging is another one of them. And I studied a lot of imaging during my training. This picture on the left is an MRI of a relatively healthy uh, spine. And you can see the bones in the front of the spine. You can see that white fluid, that spinal fluid, that bathes your spinal cord to allow it to function in a relatively healthy way. And you can see uh, a part of the brain up at the top of that image, uh, and, and things look good. And, and the diagram on the right uh, is done by an artist in, in Toronto at the lab that I used to work at. And this shows the advances in our understanding of degenerative disease. The discs are wearing out. You can see the red pinching the spinal cord. You can see the ligaments are growing too much and causing pressure on the spinal cord. And this, this is what causes disability. This is what causes uh, patients to experience problems. So through this advanced understanding of biology and imaging, we really, we've learned so much more than Leonardo da Vinci could have uh, drawn back in the 1400s. So how do we apply this human intelligence? This diagram that I showed you on the last slide summarizes a condition called degenerative cervical myelopathy. And patients with this problem tend to have neck pain and they tend to have uh, more serious problems than, than neck pain. About 400 people in southern Alberta, according to my estimates, acquire these symptoms every year. And these are clumsy hands, difficulty buttoning your shirt in the morning, difficulty holding a coffee cup, difficulty grabbing objects, 
tough taking a lid off of a jar, trouble walking, stumbling, falling. These are symptoms that result from pressure on your spinal cord. At Foothills Hospital, we operate on about 150 of these patients every year, so there's a big mismatch. There's a lot of people in our communities that are going underdiagnosed or, or not diagnosed and are suffering with these symptoms when there are treatment options available. Patients with this problem, we classify them into three categories. Scientists love to classify things. We like to describe things and classify things. And we classify them into mild, moderate, and severe. We know that the only treatment for this so far is, is surgery, but not everyone needs surgery. Patients with mild symptoms, if you have a bit of tingling in your fingertips, you probably don't want to undertake the risks of a big operation for a bit of tingling in your fingertips. But it's important to know what's causing it, and it's important to watch it closely. But if you can't button your shirt, if you're falling when you're walking outside, then maybe the risks of surgery are worth it in order to improve your quality of life. And certainly, if things have gotten so bad that you're in a wheelchair, surgery might be worth the risk to try to restore your mobility. So this is how we apply all of that human intelligence that we've gathered through historical drawings and anatomy and biology and imaging. You, you present to your family doctor and, and complain about these symptoms of trouble using my hands, neck pain, trouble walking, and your family doctor orders an MRI. And that's a picture shown on the left. This, one is, this MRI is very different than the one I showed you earlier. You can see that the spinal cord is being pinched and this results in symptoms. So they send us a letter, they fax us a letter, pretty old technology, they fax us a letter to our office and on Monday morning I show up and there's hundreds of faxes that I go through and, and look at all these faxes and then I say, oh, I need to see this patient urgently. And then I bring them in and I ask them about what are their symptoms, how long has this been going on for? I ask them about their pain, I ask them about their smoking. I ask them about their medical history, their medications, their allergies. Have they had surgery before? How are you functioning in the community? What is your social situation like? What is your quality of life? What are your functional abilities or your disabilities? And at, at a couple centers in Canada, we're one of only two centers in Canada that are acquiring these very sophisticated MRI pictures that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. I look at the myelin in your spinal cord. I look at the cells in your spinal cord. I look at how these tracts have degenerated over time, and I get all of these fancy pictures. And all of this is over 3,000 data points about each one of you. 3,000. How can I possibly use all of that information to help you? What, what do patients with mild disease really want to know? They want to know, am I going to get worse? Am I really going to get to the point where I need an operation? And the patients where we suggest surgery, they want to know if they're going to get better with surgery. Why would I take the risks of surgery if I'm not going to get better? So what we're building is an artificial intelligence platform to help put all of this data into a meaningful repository. What, what if you could compare your situation to the other 400 people that have this problem every year. We don't use your name or your birth date, but we use all of your anonymous data, all of those 3,000 data points, and we put it into a repository where you can look through it in a meaningful way. So we're, we're trying to train machine learning algorithms to answer your questions. Am I gonna get worse if I don't have an operation? Or am I gonna get better if I do have an operation? The human brain, my brain, other surgeons' brains, when we see you in clinic, we can't possibly process all of these thousands and thousands of variables simultaneously and relate it to every situation that we've dealt with in the past. It's, it's not possible. So here's one example of a neurology group that designed artificial intelligence algorithms to help them understand Parkinson's disease a little bit better. I'm not gonna walk you through this, but we're using coding languages like Python, new, new coding languages, and we're using new databases, uh, document databases to help us manage all of this data. 
and you can see how complex that diagram looks <laughs> without even me walking you through it. But this is the idea of putting all of this data together and trying to use it in a meaningful way. So are you ready as members of our community, are you ready for this transformation in medicine? What does this look like? Well, through projects like we've learned about this morning, are you willing to contribute your time and are you willing to contribute your data to help improve the lives of other people around you? Are you willing to trust the doctors and the researchers with your information and use this data outside of what's traditionally referred to as the medical chart? My father-in-law is a retiring urologist and, and watching him through this process, he's got all of these banker's boxes full of medical records and he's trying to decide which ones he can shred from 20 years ago and which ones he has to keep for another 10 years in case his patients need that information. That's a medical chart. That's a historical medical chart. I think it's time to move on from, from this and use this information to help the next generation of, of people that are facing these problems. So thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions in the, in the session to come. Thank you.